me and say, hey, I watched it today. Are we working? We are working. Great. 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 Well, good evening. And I want to welcome you to, to Bible study tonight, both in person. On, this one's shorter than the other one I'm used to using. How are you all doing tonight? All right, well, our plan is to continue in Christianity Explained, and I'm sure our teacher will be here shortly. Um, other than that, uh, on your way out tonight, don't forget to get a, um, a prayer list. It's the same one from last week. Um, if you've got any updates you want to make to the prayer list, and if you're watching from home and you want to make sure that there's something we could pray for you about, and if you're here in person, we'd be glad to pray for you too. Just let us know and we'll get that updated for next week. Uh, also, um, next week we're doing our, it's our month to serve at the food pantry. And so, you know, when we do that, we normally ask for donations, um, one pound bag of rice, um, beans, peanut butter, anything else? That's it, I think. One pound bags of rice, one pound bags of beans, and peanut butter. Yeah. So if, you, uh, if you're out and about the next few days and you want to get some of that to bring so that we can have it next week, uh, we'll be very appreciative of it. Well, um, over the past several weeks, we have been working our way through this curriculum called Christianity Explained. And uh, tonight's an important lesson. It's, it's week five of Christianity Explained, and it talks about repentance. And as we are using it, or intending to use it, for new Christians... Week five really turns the corner. Whereas in the early weeks, you talk about Jesus as the Son of God, crucified for sinners, and resurrected. In week five, you really start talking about the personal, practical application for yourself. What do you have to do in response to the truth about Jesus? And of course, it's repent. You have to turn your back on your sin and take hold of Christ by faith. And I'm looking forward to seeing some people do that through the ministry of our church. You know, I, I can see it in my mind, all the thousands of people who are going to get saved for the ministry of our church. You know, does that seem crazy to you? A thousand people? Y'all know uh, we've, we've used this question to kind of jump into my part of the teaching. How many people are going to get saved through the ministry of our church over the next five to ten years? And uh, the truth of it is, is, we really don't know. But it could be thousands. There are a thousand lost people in this town who need Jesus. And if we could get to them, if we could find them, present the gospel to them in a compelling way, and the Holy Spirit works, every last one of them could get saved through the ministry of our church. We really could see a thousand people saved through Central Baptist Church over the next five to ten years. But maybe that's a little too lofty. Maybe that sets us up for disappointment or something. What, how many would be satisfactory to you? Everybody. That's what... Christ said he wanted was everybody. everybody. He desires that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's God's will. That's His desire. That's what He wants. He wants everyone to come to see Jesus as the Savior and to love Him and worship Him. But even with that said, Jesus sometimes does things and says things that are counterintuitive. And you know where I'm going. Maybe you know where I'm going. Jesus told a parable about a shepherd who willingly left 99 good sheep in the sheepfold to go after one. One lost sheep. And so I, I think there are, are at least 3,500 lost people in Luling, Texas. How, how many, if you want to branch out to Caldwell County, how many lost people in Caldwell County are there? How many, satis, how, how many would be satisfactory? How many would you be satisfied with? Say, hey, we've saved... We've seen 15 people get saved this year. Well, that's good for this year. We'll get back to work next January. But then Jesus tells the parable that the shepherd leaves the 99 for the one. So we're going to look at this. I want you to open up your Bible. Jesus tells it in two different places. Uh, he tells it in the um, Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to look at the, the example in Luke, the time he spoke it to the Pharisees. In Luke chapter 15.
Luke 15. And we're just going to, verses 1 through 7 is what we're focused on. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? I like this verse. When he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, I kind of want us to group Bible study this one. This is a familiar parable, right? One you've probably read countless times, maybe even heard sermons about. Mike's begging me to preach a sermon on this on a Sunday morning so he can sing the song, The Ninety and Nine. Do you all know that song? I don't know that song. So maybe I'll have to do it so we can sing it. Familiar passage, but what jumps out to you about this passage? Anything, anything stick out to you? Shoulders. He takes the initiative. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful image. One of the earliest images of Jesus in the early church is the Good Shepherd. And uh, it's a, a famous fresco. You can look it up, uh, a mural. And uh, it's a little shepherd with a sheep on his shoulders. And uh, man, that's a beautiful image. My son's middle name is Shepherd because that is Jesus. That's who God is to us. He takes us up when we're weak. He leads us by still waters, restores our soul. What a beautiful image. And he takes up the lost sheep and brings it home. Powerful. What else jumps out to you? The party they threw when he got home. The party they threw when he got home. All right, now I think this is amazing because this really captures what I think Jesus was getting at with this parable. The shepherd comes home and throws a party. I found my lost sheep. And, you know, I was talking to, uh, to Joe Clark about his cows after the freeze. Talked about couldn't find one mama cow. He went everywhere looking for her, trying to track her down. Uh, must be a powerful bond between a shepherd and a sheep if it's that way between a cattleman and his cows, right? Powerful bond. He throws a party over the found sheep. And that's where Jesus ties it in. There will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need to repent. That's what Jesus wanted the Pharisees to see. The Pharisees' attitude was totally opposite the attitude of God. The whole scene begins when the Pharisees and the scribes are watching Jesus' interaction with lost people, with sinners. Uh, the way they describe them, uh, this man receives sinners and eats with them. It's not just enough for him to like, you know, pray for them. Come here, come near me, you lost people. Let me bless you. He actually takes the time to sit at the table, which is a symbol of fellowship, to break bread with them, to share in their life, to be associated with them and to identify with them. And the Pharisees were like, uh-uh, we're not having that. And it's because their heart and their mind was totally unaltered. It had been unaffected by who God was. God leaves the 99, them, to find the one. And heaven rejoices when just one person repents. I think, Amy, you nailed it. This is the thrust of the parable. It's what we're supposed to see. How God rejoices over lost people getting saved. I wonder how many of you have had the privilege of leading someone to Jesus? Can you attest to it? There's some joy there's some joy when you get to do that. I, I read a statistic yesterday in a magazine. It was a self-reported Protestant behavior in evangelism. All right, Self-reported. There's always biases built into this. You always 
say you go to church more frequently than you really do. And this one was about evangelism. And so the question was, how many times have you shared the gospel in the last year with someone else? Or I think the actual question was, how many times in the last year have you explained to someone else how to become a Christian? Now, I'm not going to ask you to answer that. And maybe 2020 is a weird year. But let's say in your typical year, leave 2020 aside, how often in a typical year do you tell someone how to become a Christian? 55% self-reported said they had done it zero times in the last year. They would not told anybody in the last year how to become a Christian. And I think that's low. That's self-reported. So a lot of people in the Christian faith never get to personally share in God's joy over sinners repenting. They never get to experience what the shepherd feels when he finds the lost one and puts it on his shoulder and runs back to the house rejoicing, so happy and overwhelmed with joy that the first thing he does is calls his neighbors and says, you guys, I found my sheep. And they're like, great. We didn't know it was missing. Well, it was, and I want you guys to come over. We're having a party. That is the master's joy. That's Jesus' joy. And most Christians have never got to experience it firsthand. And so I want to challenge you to think about this. What if it was your goal? Every, everybody here tonight, everybody watching online, what if it was every Christian's goal, every member of Central Baptist Church's goal, that at least one time before they died, they wanted first-hand experience of leaving, leading somebody to Jesus? Or if that was your goal, not a thousand. God would be glad if we saved a thousand people through the ministry of our church in the next five years. But overwhelming joy for just one. So what if it was your goal over the next 5, 10, 15 years, over the rest of your life, if God would just give you the privilege, the personal share in His joy of leading one person to Christ? That seems like a simple enough goal. Just one. Just one. Now, Billy Graham, just one. So the question you need to answer then, the question I want to talk with you about tonight, is who is your one? Who's your one going to be? His name, Jason. Jason, okay. Self-doing yesterday. All right. He's your one. He's my one. <laughs> okay, y'all got him, all right? This is online, and thousands of people are out there watching right now. They're going to hear you talking about him. I met somebody today and invited him to church on Sunday. And uh, right now, that guy is my one. All right? I'm going to work hard on it. You're supposed to see him again on Friday. So that's my one. But okay, say you don't have anybody springs to mind. Nobody springs to mind, but you're like, okay, Brad, one doesn't seem too difficult. I'm going to make that my goal, my aim, my prayer. I want it to know firsthand what it feels like, what kind of joy the shepherd has when he finds one lost sheep, and what kind of joy there is in heaven. How do you go about finding your one? Okay, and I'm going to give you some categories to think through. What about your family? Anybody in your family need the Lord? What about your close friends? I like the way this says it. Who do you call first when something good or bad happens in your life? Anybody in that circle need the Lord? What about your neighbors, the people who live next door to you or across the street from you? I'd like to walk across the street from the prophet Okay, they need the Lord. Okay, yeah. <laughs> he's probably watching. No, he's not. You can talk about him, I guess. Uh, your coworkers, all right? You still work? People who have an office next to you or you run into in the break room or at the water cooler. What about, okay, cashiers and servers? Any of them need the Lord? What about classmates? People you go to school with now or people you used to go to school with and you still see all their pictures they post on Facebook, which brings me to the next one. Online friends. It's weird how social media works. There are people that in the real world you'd probably never talk to, but they like everything you post on Facebook. It's weird. The algorithm lumps us together in strange ways. Any of them need the Lord? This is for maybe some of us younger folks. What about your fellow parents? Friends of 
your child's friend, parents of your child's friends? What about the people you see at the gym, your workout buddies and teammates? You can find one person. Are you telling me? Are you, are you really going to tell God that in all the various overlapping networks of your life, all your neighbors, your friends, your family, the cashiers and servers you run into throughout the week as you're out doing your errands, that there's not one person in your circle that doesn't need the Lord. I think we could all, if we put some effort into it, identify way more than one. So of your great big list of all the people in your circles who need the Lord, find your one. Who's going to be your one? All right, and so then you get your one. All right, and you say, what next? I've got the person identified. This is the person that by God's grace, I'm going to know the joy of leading to Jesus. What do you do next? Well, you serve your one. You serve your one. You ask your cashier, is there anything I could be praying for you about? I see the same HEB cashiers every time I run over to the HEB. They're always there. They're the same ones. Hey, can I be praying for you about something? And the next time you see them, say, hey, I've been praying for you about this. How'd that turn out? What about writing a note of encouragement while we're on the topic of HEB workers? They could use some encouragement. Why not write them a note? Hey, every time I come in here, you always have a smile underneath your mask, and I always appreciate the kind words. <laughs> Give them a note. Or you could... Uh, Send a text to an old friend asking how you could pray for him. You could go across the street, knock on the door, and say, hey, can I give you some cookies? Just want to let you know we're across here. If you ever need help with anything, you ever need to move furniture, I'm here. See him out working in the yard, you go out, hey, you know, it looks like you got a lot of work to do. Need a hand? Serve your neighbor. Serve your one. Uh, I'm going to give you this sheet, and it's got some other good ideas on it, so you can think through it. After you serve your one, any other ideas about how you can serve your one? Yeah. I have family. I guess you would say I'm prepping. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Just kind of working on his clothes yeah. until I get him face to face. Yeah, that's the way to do it. That's serving your one. Because after you serve your one, whatever you're doing, right, whether it's writing notes of encouragement or praying or maybe you want to take them out for coffee or lunch or whether you're babysitting their kids or whatever you decide you're going to do, after you serve them, you have to actually start a conversation about spiritual things. Right? You actually have to turn the corner. I guess if you want to take the parable and apply it to our lives, it's one thing to recognize, wait, I got a sheep missing. It's another thing to leave the 99 and to actually go out after them. And at some point, you're going to have to actually go out after your one. And so you may need to have a few simple questions to ask. Um, you could rely on things maybe you've learned in the past, the four spiritual laws, the Romans wrote, or some of the things that I've talked about, you know, the 30-second, 90-second testimony that I taught you a year ago. Um, you know, there was a time in my life when I was angry and self-righteous, but God saved me, right? And you could talk like that. Or you could ask something questions like this. Do you have any spiritual beliefs? No, that's not a good one. That's awkward. Can you imagine? Do you have any spiritual beliefs? Why not ask a more simple, straightforward, honest question? How are you doing? What's going on in your world? How did you guys make it through the freeze? Start a conversation and listen with open ears, right? What's really going on in this person's world? You know, the person I met today came for a specific need to the church. And I could have answered that need like that, sent them on their way. But I'm preparing to preach the sermon on Sunday from Matthew 25 on the sheep and the goats. And I had gotten really turned around in my study because the thing that's challenging to me about Matthew 25, and I'm sorry, to, I'm still in my own thunder. The thing that's challenging to me about Matthew 25 is that when Jesus comes back to judge, He doesn't evaluate our professions of faith. He doesn't evaluate our theological orthodoxy. He says, I was hungry and you fed me. And I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was a prisoner and you visited me. I was sick and you comforted me. That's the real challenging part of it to me. The theological fact that Jesus evaluates our lives, the works we've done. And so I was working on that and thinking about it. And then it really hit me. 
that, yeah, that's challenging, the theological side of it, trying to really wrap your mind around what that means, that he's going to evaluate the content of our lives and not just the words out of our mouth or the thoughts we think about him. But Jesus identifies with hungry people. You did it to me. To me. And so here's this guy who's got a very concrete need that I could have easily satisfied. But I've been studying that and realized that there's a deeper thing happening here. That it's one thing, like we read in James, to say, oh, you're hungry, here's some food, go and be blessed. Right? But there's an actual deeper need in this person's life. They need Jesus. So, how are you doing? I asked him the question. And that opened a whole other conversation. And I'm praying he's going to be at church on Sunday and hear the gospel. But you could ask another question. Do you have a church that you attend? Do you do the church thing? That's usually how I say it. Do you do the church thing? They're like, well, not really. You know, I grew up going to church. If you say you go to church somewhere, they're going to tell you what church they're a member of. But they hadn't been there in a long time. So ask them, do you do the church thing? When's the last time you went to church? You know, do, you, do what? Christmas, Easter only. Yeah. <laughs> did you grow up in church? Is good too. Did you grow up in church? Well, um, okay, you did. Well, have you been going lately? You know, something like that. How's your day going? Uh, I, I like this one. And this is kind of good. I think this is something we all should try to do. Share your testimony on social media. We share all kind of stuff. Yesterday I shared a book. My wife today shared a really flattering and humbling post about me. <laughs> um, yeah. It was a great It was. It was so good. But we could share our testimonies on social media. You know, pop up here on the selfie cam. Hey, just coming in, want to just, this is kind of weird, I know, and your angle is all bad and you feel self conscious, but you're sharing what God has done in your life, and maybe that strikes up a conversation with somebody in your Facebook feed. So, uh, another question Would you come to church with me this week? Simple question. So, you identify your one in your circles of influence, you serve your one, and then you start a conversation with your one. Now, I don't want you to hear me say that everybody that you set out to lead to the Lord is going to get saved. It's not like a Lego puzzle that you just have to stack the pieces in the right way, and when it's done, it's the thing. It's not like that. We could say that's mechanistic. A plus B equals C. One plus two equals three. Salvation and evangelism doesn't work that way. The Holy Spirit has to come in, draw that person to Christ, open their eyes, and lead them to faith. But we can be faithful messengers. That's what God's called us to do. He sent us to make disciples. And so I believe with all my heart that you can actually lead somebody to Christ. He wouldn't have sent you out. And I mean that. He wouldn't have sent you out, you out, you out, you out, you out, you out. He wouldn't have sent you out if he didn't intend to use your faithfulness in his plan to build the church. Wouldn't it make any sense. God's a God of order, not a God of confusion. And if he had done it that way, it would be so confusing. Why tell us to do something that you don't have any intention of blessing? Now, God intends to bless our efforts of sharing the gospel with other people. And so one person, you get to the conversation and they don't have any interest. You say, okay, well, I'm going to keep praying for this person and trust that maybe at a different time, God will lead them to faith. But then you identify another one and you focus on that. I believe if you do it, you will get to share firsthand in the Master's joy, the Shepherd's joy, and you'll know what it means to rejoice over one who is lost but now is found. All right, y'all got any thoughts on that before I turn it over to John to talk to us about repentance?
How does your marriage last so long and you have such a good marriage? I said, well, I read a book. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, uh, I thought I loved my wife more than anybody could love anyone. But I read this book about this, this guy who wrote it. And uh, I said, he was talking about when his wife became an invalid and he had to wait on her all the time. He bathed her, he cleaned her, he dressed her, and fed her, and just took care of everything for her. And he said, he said he never believed that he would receive that much joy in life. But because he served her, it gave him joy. Wow. Now, most people would say that if they had to do that, they'd feel a burden. Yeah. And they really wouldn't want to have to do that. They'd hire somebody to come in and do it. But he said it gave him a lot of joy. Wow. So I said, uh, he said, do you have that book? I said, I read it once and I bought 10 copies of it and that's part of my ministry. Yeah. I give those and you have to pass it on if I get it to you. Wow. So you read it, your wife reads it, and you pass it to someone else that needs the help. Wow. So he's reading it now. That's awesome. <laughs> that's really cool. They do just want to talk. Do I? They do just want to talk. That's all. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, John, you yes. Okay, Aaron. My flesh hates when I'm pulling in my driveway and there's people walking, you know, right by my driveway. Because it's like, <laughs> I don't really want to say hey. And I got a lot of groceries and a lot of kids to bring in. You know, my flesh hates it. I'm like, not to say hey. It's a random person. I'm a pastor's wife. And they know my house. And I might get egged if I don't. <laughs> Today, I was sitting in my car trying to wait for the people to pass, and my flesh was just like, just hide in the truck. You'll never know. <laughs> but instead, I was like, no, I got a bag full of friends. So I walked over to those people who were just minding their own business, not knowing that my flesh hates when they walk by my house. <laughs> and I walked over to them and gave them some money and asked them how their day was. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you are what you are. really proud of Can me. Can I borrow the whiteboard? <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, I'll get it, I'll get it for you. you okay. Mic'd up. Oh, sorry I'm late, folks. It's been one of those days. Smarties are Aaron's favorite. Oh, my. I not buy them for myself. Aaron, I love, I love those things. They are. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, yep. Okay. First steps. Christianity explained. All right. So, yes. So, just a real quick review. All right. So, the first three lessons we talked about the three things that support Christianity. You remember our three legged stool. Okay. So, one was that Jesus is the Son of God. Right? That was the first lesson. The second lesson, we talked about Jesus' death, that he died to save us from our sins. Right? And then the third lesson, we talked about the resurrection. So those were the three main things that Christianity is founded on. Any one of those is not true. If any one of those, you take it away, Christianity just kind of crumbles. So that was the basis of Christian belief. And then last week, we talked about grace. In that what God had done for us in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was completely out of love for us. It wasn't because of anything we had done. It wasn't because of anything we are or anything we said. That he did that strictly out of love for us. These last two lessons we're going to get into um, are going to talk about, okay, so if we understand what Christianity is founded on, and we know that what God is giving to us is a free gift, then what does it really mean to become a Christian? How do I become a Christian, right? Do I go down to my local church and sign a piece of paper? Do I you know, call my Christian friend and say, hey, I'm a Christian? How does this work? And one of the things I want to uh, 
bring out is this is not only something that happens once, right? If you are a Christian, at some point in your life, you probably did these things we're going to talk about. But as you live as a Christian, you learn these are things that have to be con done continually, right? Repentance is not just something that happens once. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. What is repenting? So, um, I know I've told you before, I'm not going to ask you to, to read or ask questions or answer questions. So if you, if you don't want to, you don't have to. But let's say we went to a shopping mall and we're going to do a survey. We're just going to walk up to random people and we're going to ask them one question. Right? And that question is, what do you think a Christian is? And what do you think a Christian does? Right? What makes a good Christian? What do you think some of the answers we're going to get are? Oh, I'm sure they would be too, even from Christians. Right? Because I know some of the answers we're probably going to get are, well, they go to church on Sunday, right? Or they give money, or they volunteer. We talked about these things last, in the last lesson, about all these things we do that think make us Christian. But that's not really what makes us Christian, is it? That's, that's not the idea. So, what really is a Christian? Um, I'm going to be reading out of Mark. Um, if you remember, we're studying out of the Gospel of Mark, and you actually had some homework last week. I hope you did it. Uh, no, actually it was four individual verses. <laughs> but... I'm glad you read 6 through 10. So. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to be in Mark chapter 1. So again, we're New Testament, back towards the end of the Bible. Probably you know, seven-eighths of the way through. Book of Mark chapter 1, and I'm going to be reading in verse 15. Um. And actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to start in verse 14 for this one. It says, Now after John was arrested, and we haven't talked about John. Um, he is part of the story, but it's not something that's really critical. If you have some questions about John, we can talk about him later. So now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled... And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So, in that one sentence in verse 15, we learn what a Christian is. A Christian is somebody who belongs in the kingdom of God. And then the question becomes, how do you get there? How do you get into the kingdom of God? Right? Don't walk up to the drawbridge and knock and say, let me in. Okay. He gives, Jesus gives the answer in that verse. The kingdom of God is at hand. So what do you have to do to be in the kingdom? There's two things that Jesus said. Repent and believe. All right? And so tonight we're going to be talking about repentance. And, um, you know, most of us have people in our lives, we have things in our lives that are very important to us. If we're married, it could be our, our spouse, right? If we have children, it could be our children. If we have a lot of money, it could be the things we can buy with our money. But there's always something in our life that's very, very important to us. And I don't know if you have ever told somebody, you know, if, if that was not in my life, I just couldn't go on living. Right? I, I know I've said that at times. Um, I remember as a teenager, I was just my very first serious girlfriend. When we broke up, I was just a wreck. Notice I said serious girlfriend. All right? There's something in our life that's like that. 
Well, one of the first things you do when you, when you repent is you replace whatever it is you think is very, very important in your life that you can't live without. You replace that with Jesus. And so one of the first things you say is, I am willing for Jesus to be first in my life. Now that's first before anything else. That's first before the spouse that you love so much or the children you love so much or the car you love so much. That is first before anything, before jobs, before family, before friends, before anything. That's one of the first things you have to say to become a Christian is I want Jesus because of the fact that he's the son of God, that he died for my sins, that he was raised from the dead, that this is God's free gift. Because of all that, I want him to be first in my life. That's the beginning of repentance. Right? And then we're going to read in Mark chapter 8, kind of get an idea, okay, if that's what it takes, again, it sounds good. Repentance is a big word that basically just means you're turning around. You're going one direction, you turn around and go the other direction. Right? It's a big church word. But it has so much meaning. And what we're going to look for in, in Mark chapter 8, we're going to be reading in verses 34 through 38. And starting in verse 34, this is Jesus talking now. He says, In calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. What's Jesus telling us here? He's telling us that, you know, we, we said we want Jesus to be first in our life before any of those things that we think are so important. But if you stop and think about it, who do you really think is the most important person in your life? Because if you're like most people, it's going to be yourself. Right? People, I don't care how good you think they are, people are basically selfish. And they tend to look out for themselves before anybody else. So what Jesus is telling us in this passage is not only that we need to be having him first in our life. He's also telling us that he needs to be first before my own will. That I need to be willing to live my life doing what he wants me to do even if it's not what I want me to do. I need to live my life following what he's asked me to do and not just going in my own way and doing what I want to do. So repentance begins with, I want Jesus to be first in my life, but also gets to the point of recognizing that he not only has to be first in my life because of all this stuff outside me, he needs to be first in my life because of all the stuff inside me. He needs to come be even before me. And, you know, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In a way, it's like dying. We have to, we, we kind of have to die in order to follow Jesus. 
Because we have to tell ourselves we're not the important one anymore. We have to get out of the way. We have to say, no, it's not me. It's Jesus. And honestly, sometimes that feels kind of like dying. It's not an easy thing to do. But that's what he calls us to do. And then we're going to do uh, one more of this. So I'm willing for Jesus to be first in my life. He's got to be first before my own will. And he has to be first before my ambitions. Can I ask a question before we move on? Yes, you may. Chapter 8. Sure. And this is kind of breaking the... That's, go right ahead. What, how, would you, how would you all describe Jesus in Mark 8, take up your cross daily and follow me. How would you describe that to a non-Christian? What does that actually mean? Because the metaphor is so obvious, it's the cross. Okay, everybody knows the cross is a symbol of Christianity. Take up your cross. Okay, well, sometimes the metaphor gets in the way of understanding the actual... So that's, I, you probably, I probably needed to do a better explanation because that's what Jesus died on was the cross, yeah. right? Well, so that, known that from week two. From week two. Yeah. So Jesus died on the cross because of my sin, right? So now what Jesus is asking me to do is if I want to be his follower is he's asking me in, in a way to die for him. Right, that I have to not, um, it's not suppress my own will, but that I have to want what he wants and do what he wants and go where he wants. Yeah, I got you. Even if it's not what I want to do. Right, that's that, that's really helpful. I'm just cheating because I'm preaching this passage. That's quite all right. That's yeah, no, and that's that's a good question. I know I'm your wife, we can talk about this later, but I think it's really important, like, if we. Our, we're thinking about our target population with a class like this, and who's Jesus speaking to? Dirty, sinful sinners, you yep. know, just like us. Oh, yeah. So he's saying, like, you're ashamed. When he talks about, if you're going to be ashamed of me, think about the shame that, he's, that we as sinners bring to this cross. And he's allowing us to enter into and say, follow me. You know, I'm the sinless Savior. You can take up a cross, too. He's inviting you in, no matter how much shame you have. And he's saying, you know, deny yourself. And like John was saying, you put yourself first and your needs first, but you also put your power first. Like, I can kick this addiction on my own. I can handle my problems in my marriage on my own. I can handle my bad mothering on my own. You know what I mean? You put yourself in your own power first. Yeah. But he's saying, take up my power. Yeah. Submit, even if you are ashamed. Like, I'm allowing you to enter in. And I think sinners need to hear that. Like, you don't mm -hmm. have to be perfect right. to pick up your cross. Yeah, you Jesus was perfect for you. And I think that's a message that needs to be hit home because yeah. in this world, people are... Yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to clean yourself up yeah. to be accepted. He's not telling you, first you have to put down your addiction. He's right. saying, first you have to pick up my cross. Cross, and then we'll yeah. work on the addiction. Yeah. So that's freedom. Yeah. So, yeah, that's very good. Thank you so much. <laughs> You are a pastor's wife. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So let's let's talk about this for a minute. Um, we're going to use the the idea of a house, right? And when we talk about repentance, what we're talking about is. You know, we, we say we believe in Jesus. We want Jesus to be first in our life, before my will, before my ambitions. And when we do that, we're promised in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is going to come live with us, right? So let's think of it this way. Let's think of our life as a house. And obviously, you've got the exterior of the house, okay, and the door. But inside the house... You have things like marriage, or we talked about ambition, right? You want to get ahead in life, or money, or jobs, or whatever it is, 
that we're seeking in our lives. Well, when we repent, it, it's kind of like if you've ever remodeled a house, you know, you can, you can fix up the outside of a house. If you've ever seen a rundown house, you can put new siding on it. You can put new paint on it, right? You can put new windows on it and put a new door on it. You can make it look really good from the outside. But if you don't do anything inside, what good is that house? So when we repent, when we ask Jesus to come into our lives, when we ask the Holy Spirit to come live with us, when we say we want Jesus to be first in my life, he's going to be coming in through that front door. And he's not going to stay out here and make us look pretty on the outside, right? He's going to come in and he's going to start working with us and all these things here. And that's where being a Christian can get really difficult because at that point, we really do need to be willing for him to be first in our life. And all of us, all of us, have that little closet back here with all the deep, dark secrets the special lock that nobody gets in. And guess what? At some point, he's going to be back there asking about that closet. Part of being a Christian is allowing him into that closet to help us clean it out. All right. All right, so... Um, you know, he talked about uh, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world. A lot of times we look at that and go, oh, that just means money. You know, we want to get really wealthy. But it could mean a lot of things. Right? It could mean popularity. We like being the popular person. We like being the one everybody knows, right? We want to be the Kardashians of the world, right? Bill billionaires with no observable talent, okay? But if we look in, in, uh, in Matthew 6.33, and, and I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to turn there, but Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first God's kingdom, and all these things will be given to you as well. And all these things he's talking about are things like clothes and food and you know, spouses and children and whatever. God knows what we need, and he's going to provide those for us. But once again, we don't need to be going after those things ourselves, trying to be popular, trying to be big man on the block, right? Not even keeping up with the Joneses. We've got to keep ahead of the Joneses. God knows what we need, and we still need to make him first in our life if we're going to be a Christian. Now, this is true even today even more true today than, than before. Um, C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis was a, a Christian writer. And he said that if I was going to pick a religion that was going to be easy, I would not pick Christianity. Because Christianity is not easy. And Christianity is not popular. If you want to be popular and you want to be, you know, I wouldn't suggest becoming a Christian. If that's your goal in life is to be popular and not to make Jesus first in your life, then being a Christian is not the way to go. Because being a Christian is not popular. And it's getting even more so these days, right? It, it used to be sometimes in this country that, you know, people would know you were a Christian and it wasn't a big deal. Now, it's a good way to get yelled at and called names and, you know, lots of other fun things. That happens around the world. Um, it's a good way to divide families, personal, personal experience. I've got children that are not Christian that won't talk to me because I am. So... 
let me tell you right now, a lot of times people are told, oh, if you become a Christian, everything's going to be wonderful. Your life's going to get better. You know, you're going to get that job. You're going to have a wonderful family. It's just going to be better. It's not a bed of roses. Christianity is tough. It is difficult. But it's worth it. So we talk about we want Jesus to be first in our life, before our will, before our ambitions. Here's a question we all need to ask ourselves. Because that question mark is only something you can answer. We all have something that we don't want Jesus to be first before. And that's where it gets difficult. So, I'm going to read Mark 10, verses 29 through 31. And verse 29, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. There's promises made here that God is going to take care of us in this life. That whatever we lose in this life, he's going to replace. Now, it may not necessarily be replaced in kind, right? If you lose a job, he may not give you a better job. But he'll give you more joy in the one you're doing. If you lose family members if, because of your belief as a Christian, like I said, I've got children that won't talk to me because I'm a Christian, but I have my Christian family around me. I have my brothers and sisters here. I have children in the Christian faith. I have people that are younger than me that I can help grow in the Christian faith. They're like my children. But even more importantly, in the next life, we will have eternal life with God. So yes, being a Christian is hard. Being a Christian is not easy. It, and even if it wasn't for the world around us not liking us, just being a Christian is hard because of who we are to begin with. But Jesus promises us that he will take care of us. God will take care of us. And in the life to come, after this life, we will have eternal life with God. So, kind of summarize, I mean, we've, we've talked about this. Basically, repentance, like I said, means turning. I'm going this direction. And most of the time, if I'm not a Christian, that direction I'm going is straight down the road to, to sin. I, I'm, I'm a sinner, and I'm going to sin. That's just the way it goes. And when I repent and turn to Jesus, I turn around from that sin and come back to God and say, God, help me because I'm a sinner. I need your help. And I tell Jesus, I want you to be first in my life, right? I want you to be first before my will, before my ambitions, before whatever this is, before anything in my life. So to repent means to turn. It means to trust. So I turn back to Jesus. I trust in what he's done for me that we talked about in the first four lessons. He's the son of God. He died for my sins. He was raised from the dead. This is God's free gift. I trust in that. And then I travel with Jesus and I stop going my own way.
that basically is the essence of salvation, or not salvation, of repentance, I'm sorry. So are there any questions? Other thoughts? I'm sure that they'll be like practical, but how do you put, like somebody who says like, yes, I want this, mm -hmm. what do I do next? How, what is practical to put Jesus before? What does it look like for a believer to put Jesus before their husband? Or their job? It's, bugs bugging me. Um, it really, once you have told, once you trust in Jesus, and once you say, yes, I believe what you've done for me, and I want to travel with you the rest of my life, there's a lot of other things that play into this, Right? And you have to grow. Part of traveling as a Christian is growing as a Christian. So when you're just starting out, you're going to start out with some basics. And the basics, we have another class to take care of, but I'll just tell you right now, some of the most important basics are learning how to read your Bible, learning how to pray, going to church, and learning from other Christians. But really what it is, is, you know, praying is, is basically talking to God and then listening to what he says. It can be as simple as waking up in the morning and saying, God, you know I love my husband, you know I love my wife. But if there's something you want me to do today that's more important than they are, then that's what I'm going to do. Well, you just, that right there is what you said is obedience. Yes, like that's what I think. Uh, I think that's where you got to tell a young Christian: stop yes. doing life your way and live for Jesus. Right, and that and Jesus. that is obedience. Yes, it is. And hopefully they'll get that through some of the reading. Right. You know, they'll have read some of it. Or even practically in a job, right? You go to your job and your boss tells you to do something that you know is wrong, and you used to do it. But now that you're a Christian and you know it's wrong and you know that's not what Jesus would want you to do, you're just going to have to say, no, I can't do that. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's the practical part of it, is you start thinking about the things in your life, not in terms of how would I handle this or, you know, how would you handle that or what would Dr. Phil do? But now that I know Jesus... How does it change what I do? And another thing, and you might say this so the people online can hear it, but we envision through these six weeks you teaching a group and then having some like one-on-one -on -one people mm -hmm. who would be willing to talk through some specific applications. Yeah, I mean, I'd want to see somebody say that. Right, and that's, <laughs> yeah, so what, what Brad just said, and, and the plan is that, <laughs> missed. Oh, I got those things all over my house. <laughs> Um, the plan is, in teaching this class, is not that we're just going to have a classroom full of unbelievers or, or uh, young Christians, but that we're going to have some mature Christians in there that can provide some one-on-one -on -one yeah. with people as questions arise. There, obviously, there's going to be questions that can be answered in the group. But then, if you want to get into more depth, we'll have more mature Christians in there that can can do that. Yeah. All right. You want to dismiss us? Sure. If everybody will uh, bow with me in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, <clears throat> you know, Brad talked tonight about your one. And I know the focus is evangelism, and I know the focus is talking to people about Jesus, but God, even as a Christian, even as a Christian, my one every day needs to be you at the start. And that, Father, I need to wake up and not spend so much time thinking about what I've got on my plate for the day and what needs to be done and who said this and why that and then some of all the other thoughts I have in my head. Father, I need to focus on you. And I need to ask you that day. Help me. Be with me. And Father, I need to know and I need to live 
like you're the only one in my life and that you're more important than anything else I'm going through. God, we're so thankful that you did send your son to die on the cross for our sins. And we're so thankful that not only did he die, but he was resurrected from the dead to prove his claims. That he is the son of God. That he has the power to forgive sins. And that only in him can we truly find forgiveness for the sin in our life. We thank you so much for everything you've done for us. We thank you so much for the wise Christians you've put in our lives to help us grow. We thank you so much for your word that leads us through the day. Bless us now as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen.